Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Ford School. I'm Michael Barr. I'm the Joan and Sanford Weill Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It's my delight and pleasure to welcome you here uh, this afternoon for this very special policy talks at the Ford School event, Voices from Across the Aisle. And to welcome two of Michigan's own representatives, Debbie Dingell and Fred Upton. We have brought them together as part of our new initiative, Conversations Across Difference, in a dialogue today moderated by Ford professor Brendan Nyan. I won't read their extensive and impressive uh, bios which you have in your program. As you well know, these are extremely challenging times for our nation with fractious political discourse, gridlock, and partisanship in our nation's capital, and an increasing lack of trust in institutions everywhere. The relationship between Representative Dingell and Upton is the antithesis of the partisan politics operative today in Washington. This depth of the relationship has been perhaps most poignantly displayed in the last week with the passing of Debbie's husband, John Dingell. Debbie, we are so sorry for your loss. And um, in the course of uh, last week's event, we heard uh, wonderful remarks um, from Fred Upton, um, uh, a eulogy uh, for John that was really very, very powerful. Uh, and John will be sorely missed by, uh, by many of us um, uh, here at the Ford School and in our country. Our two guests today have worked on numerous bipartisan efforts together, uh, most recently during the shutdown introducing emergency legislation to allow states to make unemployment benefits available to unpaid federal workers. Congresswoman Dingell and Congressman Upton, however, do represent different parties and different constituencies, parties and peoples with sometimes different ideologies and different policy positions. This session will look at the manner by which such divergence can help or sometimes hinder the democratic process and how we can work better together. I think it's an especially appropriate way for us to spend this afternoon of President's Day. Let me just say a small word on format. We'll have some time towards the end for questions from the audience. Please write your question on the cards provided by our staff and our staff will collect them. Joining me to present the questions, and really presenting the questions themselves rather than me, are students Kate Westa and Brett Zaslavsky, the new co-presidents of We Listen, a wonderful University of Michigan student group that fosters dialogue across difference here on campus. For those of you who are watching online, please tweet your questions using the hashtag policytalks. Uh, again, welcome to all of you. Uh, Brendan, I'm going to turn things over to you, and thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, Congressman Upton wanted to start by saying a few words about the relationship between the Fords and the Dingles, so maybe I'll turn the floor over to him. Well, it really is apropos. I mean, uh, President Ford really was known for working across the aisle and great tribute urge all of you to go to his presidential library in, in Grand Rapids and see some, some of the things that he did. But it's interesting, we did, a, we did a tribute on the House floor earlier this week, it seems like a month ago, uh, to John Dingo, a, a mentor to me, but obviously the, the dean of the House with just credible credentials. And uh, we're so fortunate to have his uh, Debbie now serve in that seat, and uh, Dingo representing Southeast Michigan for 86 years. But I want to share this with you because it's from the Ford family. Uh, Mike Ford actually sent an, an email uh, to Debbie uh, Wednesday afternoon, uh, and, and she shared it with me, and it's uh, just a, a couple paragraphs. So I just thought I'd read it because it's a good intro for, for this afternoon. Debbie, since learning of John's recent passing, my thoughts and prayers have been consistent with you and your extended family. Through my reading of the many wonderful remembrances of and tributes to John, I have been deeply moved and blessed to revisit his remarkable legacy of leadership and service to the people of Michigan and to all of our nation. John and my father, though identified from competing political parties, hold so much in common as men of wisdom, integrity, compassion, and selfless service for all of humanity, and their friendship was true and enduring through a shared lifetime calling of public service. John Dingle and Jerry Ford represent what is good, honorable, 
and decent in our country. May you know of God's abiding comfort, but um, it's appropriate for where we really want to see the country move. We work together uh, to solve the nation's problems. Jerry Ford did that. Certainly John Dingle did that. Debbie and I try our best to follow that path. John and Jerry Ford were friends for decades, and they did a lot of stuff together. They really did. Um, so I thought we could start. That's a beautiful way to start this, this event and, and really consistent with the kinds of issues we'd like to talk about. I wondered if we could talk first about bipartisanship in practice, which is something that you two practice in your relationship as legislators and something that people often hunger for in this country. We talk about a lot, but I actually think people don't hear about it very much. A lot of the bipartisan work in Congress is, is somewhat under the radar. The conflict gets more media attention and more coverage. So I wonder if you could talk about an issue or two where you've worked closely together and your offices have collaborated, especially on things that are relevant to, to us here in Southeast Michigan, like PFAS or opioids. I'm, and, I, you know, Congress, Congresswoman, maybe you could start and talk about that. You know, first of all, I want to say, I don't look at somebody and say, oh, you're a Republican and oh, you're a Democrat. I look at somebody as an individual who's coming from some place from, I'm looking at Rusty Hills, who I've known for decades, maybe longer than Fred. I don't know which one I've known longer. Um, and I don't look at Rusty and say he's a Republican. He's someone I've worked with for, and I hope you're teaching the kids well too. Um, uh, but, you know, you start, you can't, if you want to pass something, if you want to get something done that's going to be good and right for this country, you don't do it working for just one side. You build a coalition. You find the common ground. You find the way that you can get something done. So for us, I mean, Fred has been one of my dearest friends. He's always, he'll always be older than I am, too. Yeah. But, <laughs> Not, but, you know, you, it's a few months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it, 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 we come, our common ground, and for the Michigan delegation, the common ground is Michigan. We love this state. We want to do what's right for it. So the Great Lakes, the auto industry, uh, PFAS, uh, so many uh, issues that really matter to people in this state that we talk with each other. How do you build that coalition that will get done what's got to get done to do what's right for the state that we represent? You know, things flip. Uh, when I was first elected, so I worked for President Reagan a lot of years ago, and he had a wonderful relationship with the Congress. You know, Republican president, Democrat Congress, but he got a lot done and the country loved him. When he ran for re-election, he won 49 states. I mean, that's the real test, you know. Man, he lost only Minnesota. He won California, New York as a Republican. But when I came, I never thought the Republicans would ever be in the majority because they hadn't been for my lifetime. They really hadn't. And so, I, was, uh, I sat down with our leadership and they brought in all the Republican freshmen together and they said, you know, hey, if you have a good idea, two things are gonna happen. It's either gonna get stolen or to be defeated. You're really, you know, you don't have a lot of Republican votes here. And I said, no, that's not gonna happen to me. And so I made the decision that virtually every issue that I've ever worked on has been bipartisan. I'll reach across the aisle. I got a lot of Debbie, I got a lot of friends like Debbie on the other side of the aisle, and a lot of Republicans on my side that want to work together. And somehow I got to be, end up chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, arguably the most important committee in the Congress because we have more jurisdiction than anybody else. And guess who taught me? John Dingle, uh, who was a great chairman for me. And I, like to think I was a great chairman for him because he was uh, on, the, on the committee later on. And the proof in the pudding is that, you know, we had a Democratic president. President Obama was pr president of all, all my tenure as chairman. And guess what? He signed more than 200 bills that we moved through our committee, all on a bipartisan basis, into law. One of those that impacts everyone here big time. And Debbie did a, a wonderful, we had a, a couple of round tables here in an in Arbor called 21st Century Cures, where we speed up the approvals of drugs and devices. We added $45 billion to health research over a 10 year span, and the NIH money is so important for all of our educational institutions, but if we're gonna find the cure for cancer and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, it will be because of the work that we did on this bill. Debbie had a great 
uh, group here of dis different disease groups talking about the need to make sure that we can find the answers to these. And it was overwhelming, powerful. And at the end of the day, that bill took three years to get done. We passed it 392 to 26 on the House floor and 92 to 8 in the Senate. And we went, and it literally took the very last day of the Congress uh, to get it done. I mean, you know, we had to get cloture. We had to do all these different things in the Senate to run things through. But, you know, it was bipartisan, and it will impact everybody's life on the planet. So let me, let me also give a plea for the value and, of partisanship and polarization. Sometimes the parties do disagree, and that's an important part of our democracy, too. We should need to make sure not to lose sight of that, right? Political scientists think parties are essential to democracy. Parties help, uh, you know, contesting the issues of our day is an important feature of our political system, too. So I wonder if you could talk about a time when you decide to move forward with a policy issue on a partisan basis. You mentioned health care. That's certainly an issue where the parties have moved in different directions, not on that bill, right, but on the core issue of the ACA and whether to repeal it or not, right? The parties have taken a really different path. So I wonder if you could talk about, I mean, Congresswoman, the challenge of, of, of policymaking on these issues where the parties fundamentally disagree and what can be well, done about it or whether you should just I'm go on your own. I don't think it was good. Okay. And I got in trouble with the Young Turks because I said that I wish that there had been Republican support. And actually, Poor Fred. Watch that shoulder. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I hit a tree skiing, so I just had a little surgery over here. But. You know, um, I have great friends on both sides of the aisle. So last week, um, there was a, I love him, the Republicans, he's a Republican. Some, oh, the, I, mean, he, I know. You can tell how Fred feels. Um, but Louis Gomez from Texas is, um, I mean, he, he and I did some good, it, it, Look, I know everybody thinks he's crazy. I love him. But he is writing an op-ed for Nolan Finley right now. Fred can't believe this. And he is making the point that if John Dingell had been, and I'm, I don't want to get political. This is. But he's making the point that if John Dingell had been chair of the committee, the Affordable Care Act would have been written with Democratic Republican support. And that it would have, uh, Democrats wouldn't have had the problem. Here's what he was telling Nolan on Friday. Um, Democrats wouldn't have had the problem they had in 2010. I think a bill, when you are passing a bill of such significant policy, that if it is partisan, half the country's not going to accept it. I'll tell you right now, I don't know if I'm going to make somebody mad. I don't know if we, if the time comes for impeachment, Impeachment should never be done on a partisan basis. It's going to tear the country apart. You need to have everybody there understanding what that wrongdoing was. And you need to, we're not Republicans or Democrats, we're Americans first. So I, you know, some, I horrify everybody by saying some days, why do we need the two-party system? Are there, shouldn't we have independent candidates? So I'm not going to go, I mean, I do think that the parties provide us and I, I mean, well, I mean, I don't know how many people here know. I was a Republican when I married. I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> John Diggle, but I was yeah. a Milliken <laughs> Republican. And Bill Milliken was more liberal than John Diggle on some subjects. So I think it's important for somebody who gets elected to know what their values are and to know what you stand for and to always stand for that values and never, never, never not know what you believe in. So let me just say two things. First of all, I concur with what Debbie said about uh, John Dingle been chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee at the time. I didn't time. say it. Louis did. All right. <laughs> Louis said it, right. He I'm going to remind Louis. him next week when I see. He, uh, it would have been bipartisan. Uh, I think that uh, there are some things that they could have done to have done that. And, you know, I can remember when President Obama first came into office and we did this big stimulus package. Remember, it was like $750 billion. And I went to Rahm Emanuel and some others and said, you know, I care about jobs. We were going through a terrible recession then. A lot of people, you know, were really hurting bad. And there were some things as it related to the auto industry that had they done it, I think, looking back, you can ask her when you talk to her tomorrow, Candace Miller. She was one of my colleagues. Great great uh, friend and colleague, uh, no longer in the Congress. But she and I were both on the auto caucus, and had they done something on autos, 
I think we would have been there, and I think we did a motion recommit, which is a li little inside baseball, but it, had that been as an amendment on the bill, you would have got us uh, on board. You know, the tax bill that we did, yes, I believe strongly that it really helped the economy. It could have been better. Could have been it could a lot have been better. better. Could have been better. <laughs> yeah, no, it could have been better. I and I wish that, it, that we had had some Democratic votes for it. Then you should have written a better bill. Well, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Time out, wait a minute. It was in our committee. In Ways and Means, they have this special right. When they bring a bill to the House floor, there's no amendments. But they should have had, you know, I worked with some of the uh, folks on the committee trying to get, get it to be where I think they would have had some Democratics, uh, Democrat votes. Uh, but they, it was tragic that they didn't you know, get, get some of those provisions included. But, so. so what do you think are the forces that are the reason, right? So a lot of this, there are good people, right? There are good people. We have good people on the stage, right? But there, there's an institutional process, right, that's generating the bills that people vote on, right? But so how do you think this lot, works in but terms seriously, of the, the House? Though, a lot of the bills that we pass, you, so you read, you know, you get the 24-7 news, and everybody watches one network or the other, depending upon where their mindset might be. But at the end, when you really look, so we just came through a terrible shutdown the last five weeks, okay? But look how it finished up. 300 people voted for it. Debbie and I, two of the 300 that voted for it. It could have happened five weeks ago. It should have happened five weeks ago. Uh, the, uh, there was actually a, a better deal that may would have even had more votes at the end. We went through this terrible dilemma the last five weeks uh, and, that nobody was happy with, everybody was a loser, and it was really unfortunate. But at the end, it was bipartisan to get us out of that hole that we were in. And the Senate did the same thing. I was with Gary Peters this morning over in Holland, and you know he was one of those with Debbie Stabenow. Both our senators voted for it, but it passed three to one over there. Now, you know that wasn't what we saw Friday when the president signed it into law, but it really was a bipartisan effort. Uh, getting putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, and all of us uh, pretty disappointed with what happened the previous five weeks. Do you think that's going to set a precedent? So I mean, so let's let's talk about the consequences of polarization. So something people worry about. It's not just that the parties disagree. It's when government can't function because of polarization, right? So the shutdown has made that quite dramatic, right? And there's definitely a a temptation, right, to take these more extreme steps, right? There's lots of ways, as you both know, to shut government but down. But they don't control things. So you got the hard right and the hard left. But most of us are in the, in the main lane there. And if you allow, so one of the things that Debbie and I did a couple years ago, we joined this thing called the Problem Solvers Caucus. And we had a real win beginning last month, January, when the rules of the House actually were changed, forced to change. As frankly, I don't, as an outsider, I don't think Nancy Pelosi would have been Speaker had she not agreed to those changes, to the rules changes. But now there is going to be a much greater emphasis, I think, on bipartisanship, on forcing amendments that are bipartisan to be allowed and debated on the House floor, whereas they were denied before. And we've been working together for the last couple of years now on a number of issues. But now with these rules changes, we're going to be in a better spot. But because if you can show it's bipartisan, the Rules Committee, which is not something you learn about in ninth grade civics or even poli sci when I went here, graduated from Michigan, but that Rules Committee dictates what amendments can be allowed on the House floor after the committee is done with them. And if you can promote bipartisan amendments that may change that, the whole thrust of that bill, whether it be a tax bill, or whether it be a health bill, whatever, all of a sudden you put more emphasis in the middle where if you can get agreement, that's going to happen. And, and we're going to push that. We're, we've got a couple of really good ideas that we're going to be pursuing, whether it's on, um, you know, health policy or some other things. Congresswoman, what do you think? I think we're at a precipice. And I, th I think, um, you know, we're most focused in a lot of people's lives were hurt by the most recent shutdown. There were um, people have no idea, you know, really good. I mean, if you just look at the Coast Guard, the Customer and Border Patrol, the TSA, the FBI, Secret Service, we're all working and not being paid. 
They were, and if you, I, I was trying to meet with them uh, almost every day or talk to them, and they were scared to death. Um, you know, all of those branches are, if you get a bad credit rating, you could lose your job, but they couldn't afford to drive to work. They, uh, couldn't, I had a woman from this district that uh, had been deemed essential. She couldn't afford to pay for her daycare. She was going to lose her daycare spot for her child. She wasn't allowed to take time off to take care of her child, even though she was not being paid because of her status, she would have lost her job. So she took the midnight shift at Denny's to pay for her child. And I think there was more. But remember that a year ago, we had two shutdowns almost back to back. And I, I think all of us have to look at what's happening in our country. It's not a way to govern. Um, I think each of us, Democrats and Republicans, have to look ourselves in the eye. I think um, I'm, this, isn't a this isn't Republicans or Democrats. We Democrats have had these. But we cannot let the far right and the far left dictate what is happening. There, I mean, Fred, I love you, but too many members of your party are afraid to stand up when the president is doing something wrong uh, because they're afraid what the impact will be. Uh, I, I, I'm worried about what is happening in the future of this country, and I think every American's got a responsibility to stand up, to elect people that are going to do what's right, and we need to worry about this democracy. I think we live in the greatest land in the world. United we stand, divided we fall. Do you think there are things we can do to pull the parties back from that kind of those kinds of extreme measures? Or is it just something where you have to feel the political costs? Like you both described the human costs and the political costs of the shutdown. Um, but imagine a world where now the Democrats have the opportunity to exploit the debt ceiling the way we saw in the past, right? The next time the debt ceiling has to be increased, right? <coughs> That threatens financial chaos, right? And you can stick something on that, use it to exploit your, you, you know, exploit your leverage to pursue some policy priority, right? So the, the concern is, right, that under those circumstances, right, there are a lot of pressure points that people can apply if they're more extreme. So is that something, if, for folks, who, you just both to kind of describe yourself as being in the main lane of your parties, how do you keep both parties from, to, from using those kinds of tactics? Well... Debt ceiling is a, is a is a tough vote for anyone uh, to to vote for, you know, Republican or, Democrat. or a Democrat is right, but it has to be done. I mean, we're we're on a track that you know you're not going to get a balanced budget this year. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen uh, under any under any scenario. And you know, it's unfortunate that there was actually a a, a budget reform uh, effort at the end of last year. It was bipartisan, but they had to get a supermajority to, to get the votes to get it done. Uh, I was asked a little bit earlier this morning, you know, we have this one-year budget uh, issue. It ought to be a two-year budget. Um, you know, we're dealing with trillions of dollars, uh, and, you know, the, the budget is supposed to, by law, is supposed to be done by April 15th. When I worked for President Reagan, it, it came up to Capitol Hill on the first week in January, uh, I worked at the Office of Management and Budget, and we sent the Reagan budget up in an ambulance because we were told it was dead on arrival. <laughs> and so we wanted a, sort of a clever idea that we did, and it got a lot of attention, and it was dead on arrival. You know, it didn't, didn't, but it sort of sets the stage. Well, here we are now. It's already mid-February, and because of the shutdown, we're not going to see the president's budget even released until for another month. How in the world are we going to, you know, live to the law that it's got to be enacted by April 15th? Ain't going to happen. So changing that process, which would include the debt ceiling, and that was one of the ideas that they were looking at, um, I think we, we just have to realize that times have changed from where we were before, and, and, um, and it, it has to go up because otherwise we default. And when, if you default, that means interest rates are even going to be higher than they otherwise would have been, which only adds to the deficit. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a bad snowball that goes down the mountain. You know, you keep saying party system, sort of implying the two-party system. I would actually argue with you that, I mean, it, I mean the, the, who is the Democratic Party? We, on our, well, who is the Republican Party? 
Uh, but it's also the, Dem it's actually the Socialist Democratic Justice Party, which is not, I mean, is a different party that is, that defeated Joe Crowley and um, AOC, who I love, actually, and, um, and talk to a lot. Uh, it, it, you know, inside the Democratic Party, such as the same inside the Republican Party, that is terrifying. So each party has its own. So I don't, and if, even when you talk about the two-party system, it's Ralph Nader that kept Al Gore from being elected. When you look at the populist vote. Ross Perot. It, Ross Perot. So it's not as clean mm -hmm. as you want to make it. And there are a lot of dynamics you got to. Absolutely. Well, so let me let me ask about one. So let me get, so so the parties are quite diverse internally, and that's one of the things that creates opportunities for bipartisanship in some cases. So I want to ask Congressman Upton about um, joining the the Climate Solutions Caucus. So yeah. that's that's an area where people were. So the parties may differ on how yeah. to address climate change, but the underlying science and coming to agree on it yeah. and starting to find a path forward on addressing it yeah. seems like an important issue. So it what is, do you think about is. that? Climate change. How, I mean, how, does how anyone here not believe in climate change? I mean, it's happening, right? There may be one hand or two. Them, but we're but not yeah, at you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, Hillsdale we, College is not in my district anymore. So it's a, no, I'm just. Um, we tell the truth. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm proud to be on the Climate Caucus. It's happening. Uh, we all want, I mean, I grew up on the shores of Lake Michigan when I care about uh, the environment, air and, and water and everything else. And if we can have a cleaner environment, we are all better off for it. Uh, I was one that publicly scolded the president for pulling out of Paris. Uh, let's have these goals. Let's see if we can work together. And yeah, I wasn't real happy that China and India weren't part of that, and they, they get to go, uh, you know, increasing their emissions dramatically over the next couple of decades before they, they come to a magic moment with Jesus on this. But at the end of the day, we all got to work on, on the environment. And we, we're going to have a hearing that was canceled this week, uh, but our first hearing as top Republican on the Energy Subcommittee is going to be on energy efficiencies. I'm glad, you know, I got a new Jeep this year, or I guess it was last year. I, I'm delighted that it gets 10 or 15 miles better per gallon. I had a miles per gallon uh, than my old Ford. Um, and this one has four wheel drive and I needed it this morning. Uh, uh, so I had some terrible accidents, but you know, we ought to be investing in that type of energy efficiency so that we can reduce uh, emissions, not only here, but show, show the way for the rest of the world. Yeah, this is a bipartisan caucus, the climate change uh, group, and I'm delighted to be part of it. And, and it shows uh, that, you know, we do need to work together. Just another issue of, of where we can get some bipartisanship on an issue that most Americans would agree is it, it really is happening. So, Congresswoman, are you, are you optimistic? So I was just on the Hill, and I heard kind of two stories. One, that the Green New Deal was potentially polarizing Republicans, and another that this was maybe a moment where the parties could find some common ground. So do you think climate is an area where the progress can be made? That is a complicated question. The Green New Deal <laughs> may be a little bit too heavy a lift. I was, t uh, uh, look, <laughs> <laughs> the Republicans are going to try to force a vote at everything they can inside the Green Deal, let's be honest. There's going to be a vote on it, I even read in the Senate. <laughs> um, but I do, um, you know, look, we come from Michigan. So I, uh, um, I went to AOC, Alexandria. She's actually become a, a good friend. Um, he would like, and he's, a lot of people are trying to figure out how we've become good friends with me being from an auto state. And, but I, I said to her, I want you, I want to work with you on something. Uh, I, a part of the Green Deal is to go to a carbonless, uh, society, which means we got to keep improving automobiles, which means we need electric vehicles. But people aren't buying electric vehicles because they don't have confidence in the battery. They don't, we have no infrastructure system. We have nothing so they don't trust the range. We've got to build an infrastructure system to support it. So instead of, instead of everybody, you know, the end of the world is here, the end of the world is here. Let's work together to do what we've got to do to keep us, uh, put it in a positive way. And then actually Rashida was with me on another day. And I said, Rashida, I'm inviting. She, uh, it, She's another colleague for those of you who don't I'm know. I'm sorry. 
I think everybody knows the names I of three know. Democratic We don't know her on my side of the state, but... Uh, you know who they are. Yeah, I know. You're I demonizing do. them all the not time. A, no, not me. I don't do that. He doesn't. Um, uh, but uh, she's going to come to Detroit, and we're going to... So, you know, I, do, I don't... I mean, by the way, I don't look at her and say she's a Democrat, and I don't... I talk to people. I find where the common ground is. Because by the way, we do need to do something about it. But I want to protect jobs and I want to build the infrastructure. So I don't, instead of looking at people, oh, that's Republican or Democrat, I look at somebody, where can we find that common ground and actually find something? I think that's, now this, I think, is the difference between a man and a woman. <laughs> I think women are problem solvers. I think we're used to balancing multiple balls in the air, and we try to figure out, that, and that's why we need more women in politics, and that's why we need more women in government. Because we look at things, and we don't look and say, oh, he's a, you know, near that. We look and say, how do we solve the problem? And that's what I think we need to do more of, period. All right, well. Um, okay, uh, I got him rattled yeah, on that one. Yeah, no, that was good. That was good. Um, so uh, well, cause let's talk about an, a hard issue to get people together to solve problems on, which is immigration. Um, we just had a government shutdown over it. Um, the president has declared a, a national emergency. It's going to go to the courts, right? There's a, there's a lot happening. And one thing I think that's important to think about is, 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 is you know, when, the president, when any president gets involved in an issue, it can sometimes actually make it harder to find compromise. So I wonder how, you, right. how, you, how you think about this anything, issue now, right, now, right? Where Democrats actually are counter polarize on immigration as Trump has come has come out so strongly on it, right? You're seeing more Democrats who are taking more liberal positions on that issue than they have in the past. So I wonder how you think about how the, the the House is going to be able to handle this issue and what the right as a policy matter, what you think the right path forward is. Well I hope that we can get this done. Um, actually it's it was the first issue that really brought the problem solvers caucus together on an issue. It was newly formed. Uh, we were in a shutdown in December of 16, 17, December of 17. We were, supposed to be, we were supposed to be home in our districts doing something else, and we weren't getting out of session. And a bunch of us got together at Tijuana Coat. What, Tijuana, what is that restaurant? No, it wasn't Tijuana. It's no, Tortilla it's, Coast. T t yeah, Tortilla <laughs> Coast. He down in <laughs> down in the basement. <laughs> I remember, I drank your water. Remember, I started choking on this. Anyway, all right. But we started working together. There are about thirty members of Congress that literally filled up this basement. We had two tables, and we started. You know, what is it that we have to do uh, on immigration reform to really open up the process so we can have some votes? Because it's broken. It's gone on way too long. Not only for employers, but you know the, the Dreamers and the DACA kids and all these different issues that just, it breaks your heart. And I worked with Debbie on a couple of cases, uh, individuals in her district to try and help her so they could stay. I've got a couple people on, on my side of the state as well that it just, just breaks your heart. And we made a difference. I mean, we, we forced it, but then at the end, we didn't have the votes to get it done in the House or the Senate. Uh, in the Senate, they actually got 54 votes, but they didn't get 60. They had a couple different versions. Again, they're bipartisan groups that came together. And our group, Problem Solvers, met with the president, President Trump, a couple weeks ago uh, during the shutdown. I didn't. Yeah, you were supposed to go, but you didn't. You t we, anyway, was by, we had about you know 15 members or so down in the Situation Room. We talked about immigration. And, you know, the, the, the president, I know he'd like to see us move. This is on the over, not the wall part, but, the, the, yeah, he does want to go there. But, I mean, on the other issue of Dreamers and others, he spoke to the American Farm Bureau National Conference in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago, and in his speech he talked about solving the issue for the ag workers. Yeah, that's, that's going to be hard to do, but it's got to happen. Uh, and as I told the president, I complimented him on that, but I said, we, there's some low-hanging fruit here. A lot of us thought that this whole shutdown issue, and if you go back, look at the Wall Street Journal, or <clears throat> uh, you look at the Chamber of Commerce and some other people, s some proposals, they really thought there was a grand deal that we could do. 
that you could do both border security and you could combine a number of elements on the immigration side that would make some sense to get a package to get it done. Legal status for folks that, that have been here. I mean, a whole number of different things. And at the end, that part didn't make it in the equation. It has to, though. We've gone too long. Uh, and I know that uh, just this week, in fact, I was sitting behind uh, Steny Hoyer at the, at the funeral on, for John on Thursday, and I, you know, I was doing business, you know. And before it started, I was talking to, to Steny, who's the majority leader, number two position in the House. And there's been, there was a, a public effort this week to talk about uh, some legislation with dreamers that will be bipartisan. So I, I want to say hundreds of businesses have signed on to some letters of support to try and get things done. And I leaned over to Steny and said, we got to make sure that this is bipartisan because we got a lot of Republicans that want to work on this to try and get it done. And I'd like to think that we can. It's a, it's a major issue for me, uh, particularly as, as I know so many of these uh, folks and their individual stories and some of the bad things that are happening you know, to them because we don't have status uh, for them that, that's really got to get fixed. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm a Cubs fan, I'll confess. I, you know, I root for the Tigers as well. But, so I'm an optimist. And I'm encouraged that we can get something done on this. And I know that our Problem Solvers Group has been very involved in this, really, from the, the first moment of its inception. Do you have anything you want to add, Congresswoman? We need comprehensive immigration reform. We need to get some balls and get it done. Uh, it's been, we've needed to get it done for 20 years. The DACA kids, they are Americans in every single way. These kids, I mean, they're your classmates. They go to school with you. They just, they, they, they're paying taxes. They're fighting and defending this country. And they've become a political football. So that's where we got to find that in getting businesses here, we got to build the coalition that's just going to get this done once and for all. And that's, um, that's what business has become much more involved. And it is, I mean, we, the, the hospitality and entertainment industry, the construction industry, the uh, agriculture industry, they all have economic issues here. So we got to build the coalition that's going to bring people from both sides and say, enough's enough. Let's get this done. The country needs to get us done. And let us stop and stand up to the people trying to divide this country with fear and hatred. And we need to do that on both sides of the aisle. Stand up to it. Call bigotry for what it is and stop letting people divide us with fear and hatred. So what, yeah, what do, uh, let's take up that point. I mean, so when people worry about our political system, it's not just that the parties disagree, right? It's the way they view the other side. So I, I, I wonder if we could talk about that a little more. Like, what do you see are the, the forces that make it so hard for um, these compromises to be found? And, and to what extent you think, what are the factors that are making your colleagues in some cases appeal to the worst in people or be more combative and uncivil than we'd like to see. Because we do see it in public opinion, right? We see people see the other party in more negative terms than they have in the past, right? So people are getting this kind of message about the other side. And I wonder how, you know, why you think that is Actually, and how, what we can do about it. They see all politicians from a <laughs> yeah. negative perspective. Yeah. So you want me to go first? Um, you got you to reach out and find people on the other side of the aisle that you can work with. And I got, you know, this is early in the Congress, for this Congress. You know, we went through this, you know, terrible thing the last uh, five weeks. Things now, I, I think, get back to normal when we come back into session next week. But I think it's, it's the caucuses. It's your state delegations. It's the votes that you have that you really do. You know, I have not met AOC yet. Uh, I know who she is, you know. I've uh, seen her, but I've not been, you know, anywhere close to say hello. But you gotta, you got to build those relationships and see people look at you in, in reverse side of, of having respect for, you know, willing to stand up, you know, when, when you need to on a, any particular issue. And, and to build that relationship of trust that hopefully can try to get things done. I would also say that the Congress needs to remember that they're an equal branch of government to the executive branch. And the Congress needs to stand up and do its job. Uh, I guess I I'm, uh, would encourage you all to read something that was in the Washington Post last week. Um, OK, you finish. Well, 
Big John on his uh, day, die, day, uh, day, uh, day. day uh, wrote a really wonderful piece that really reflected on his uh, career and where the country needed to go. And we should have actually made copies and, and had them here, but you can, you can Google it. Um, and it was more than just the Washington Post. It was the national news, uh, broadcast news. It's, it's everywhere. You can find it real easy. Um, but he, you know, he, he, he was involved in every issue since I've been alive. I mean, he was voting on those issues. Uh, Steny Hoyer made the point at the funeral earlier this week that John had already been in Congress 25 years before he was elected, and then they served 38 years together. <laughs> so he saw all these debates, and he, he really offered pearls of wisdom for where we have to go. And it's very much along what this place, the Ford Policy School, really cares about. Working together, having ideas go first, put policy ahead of uh, politics, and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, don't worry about your next election. Um, but really wor worked uh, on a, you name the issue, to get things done. It was, it was a wonderful piece. And if you read his book, uh, and, uh, you know, he gave me a, a copy uh, that I finished a couple weeks ago. You know, I, I've saved the article that was in the Post, um, and that'll be taped on the inside of the, the book jacket. Uh, it talks about this point. Yep. That you're... Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could maybe speak to the, especially the young folks in the room, the students and the people who are thinking about their lives, like both in terms of, you know, what you would say about the importance of public service, which is something that's really come through in both of what you've said, um, but also how they, can, how they can be involved in the political system. What are the ways that, you know, they can make their voice heard in Congress? Like you know about how members of Congress think about what their constituents um, are, are, are feeling. So, you know, what are the best ways for them to kind of communicate that to, to be heard in our democracy? You know, I, I, f first of all, everybody needs to become involved. Your voice matters. You know, I got public service, one, the only decent thing, the only good thing that came out of this most recent government shutdown is maybe people thought about public service and thought about, you know, we all love to take, take pot shots at government officials, and they began to realize the functions they serve and that they're there for the common good, to make all of our lives better and to make our community strong. I got involved in politics um, when I was your age. My roommate got very sick with a heart condition, and uh, uh, she was a woman. And uh, in, I found out there was no information. You know, the heart study and aspirin a day keeps, your, keeps the doctor away is still the most significant cardiac heart study that's been done in the history of this country. Framingham Heart Study is what it is. And there are, to this day, there are no women in it. Think about that. So I started the National Women's Health Resource Center because the federal government would not allow women to be included in any research program because we had hormones. We're more than 50% of the population, but we had hormones, whoops. So that's what got me involved. And um, it got me very, and I met people, and I started to become engaged. And I tell, I know you're going to, now they're going to hate me when I say this. I tell young people, don't get a political science degree. Care about hey. something. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but care about, the Ford School's not political. Okay. But you guys get into. She had too much of this big bowl. <laughs> care about, is it poverty? Is it housing? I was talking to some of the kids before this. Get, understand what your passion is and go learn about that and then go into the public policy arena and fight for the change you want to see. I guess the other piece of it, I, I said this earlier, just I think to somebody, social media is a great tool. It's one of the great thing that's happened. It's also the worst thing that's happened in the world. Forget the United States of America, the world. People are not civil. You feel like you've got a blanket you know, to say whatever you want that's awful and terrible, you take it as a substitute for involvement. I think I would, you know, and actually this was another message that um, John Diggle had last week, which is just to take a second 
and try to be a little gentler, to try to think about the way that you say things. And I would also say that as you look at public service. How do you connect with somebody else? John Diggle would always say this, you've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. Use those ears to listen, to understand other people's perspective, to grow. I don't believe in the same things today that I, hey, I'm a Democrat now, not a Republican. I got smart. Um, <laughs> but I guess that's one of the things that I would say. I'd say real quick, uh, start. Um, it's real easy to be involved. Now, I got to say that when I graduated from Michigan with a journalism degree, uh, my goal was to go write for the, the Cubs or somebody else. And I met a young guy that was running for Congress who I had never met before. And I volunteered to help him. I got six cents a mile. Uh, and uh, later, I, and he won. And my dad said, I cannot believe, I remember him sitting down. He said, Fred, you graduated from such a wonderful school. You had a great start. You're, and we, had, we were challenging an incumbent. Incumbents don't lose. So you are working for a loser. <laughs> I don't know where this is going to take you because six months from now, you're not going to have a job at all. And guess what? We won. And I had never been to Washington. And I went, and, you know, I was in charge of special projects and, you know, work, working with local leaders. And it was a wonderful job. And four years later, I was ready for another challenge and, you know, ended up at the White House. I did that for four years, and then people called and said, would you run for Congress? And I said, I'm happily married. I got two black labs. I, I salute the, uh, the Marine Guard in the West Wing of the White House every day going in. No, I'm not interested. I never thought about running for, you know, I'm not even been a precinct captain. Let it run for Congress. <laughs> and so then they convinced me to, to change my mind, and we won. And it's real easy, and I, you know, I, I look, you know, well, it's the staff. Not real easy. Well, no, 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 <laughs> no, it's not. No, but it's no. You didn't let me finish. We're it's real to easy to get involved. <laughs> you didn't let me say finish. <laughs> so I'll cut me off like that. But, <laughs> but you know, I look at you know, we we couldn't do the job that we did without our staff, without our spouse. Couldn't ever do it. And I'm just so fortunate to have you know, we have terrific interns, but. You know, the, the, the people that work for me, they're just as dedicated. They work just as hard. They care just about those same issues. So it's easy. It's easy. Get involved. Start. All right, great. Well, I'm going to turn over to the questions now. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Brett Soslovsky, along with uh, Kate Westa. And as Dean Barr was saying, we're the new co-presidents of We Listen. Our first question is coming from Facebook, which is, in the spirit of bipartisanship, what major bipartisan legislative milestones or policy areas can you anticipate progress on this coming session? I'm hoping uh, for a, a lot of issues. But I think I'll give you one that I think is very important. Healthcare, prescription drugs. I don't think there's a Republican or Democrat that doesn't have constituents, a diabetic patient whose insulin costs have gone up monthly by 200, 300, 400 dollars. We all know we've got to do something to make drugs more affordable for working men and women. I think that's an area we will reach, don't you agree? I think there's some real possibility there. And I will just say I've driven across the state twice now, back and forth in the last uh, six days. Infrastructure. <laughs> Potholes. <laughs> And uh, I, I look at our roads, and uh, you know, and, you know, we've had the worst winter ever, and they're really bad. But you know, we we were all up together up at the Sioux Locks uh, two years ago as a delegation with Governor Snyder. That lock hasn't been; it was built 60 years ago. The Po Lock, P O E. And if that lock somehow went out, you would double the na the nation's unemployment rate almost overnight. None of that iron ore would get down to the steel plants. So whether it's the autos or you name the industry that needs steel, we're, we're done. Um, it's going to cost a billion dollars to replace that lock. And we're starting now to see that happen. That will be, I hope, part of that infrastructure project that will be bipartisan that we need to get done. You know, you're also seeing on clean water, PFAS. I think there, you will see very significant hearings and legislation to yep. 
uh, hold, begin to hold EPA more accountable than they were under a certain EPA administrator. As you touched on, uh, the media promotes partisan controversy for ratings and advertising over the types of relationships that you guys have. Um, what can we as Americans do to incentivize bipartisan action? Well, I, you know, I, you, gotta, you need to look, people need to look at the whole picture. They pick out one, you know, this year we'll cast 600 votes. Um, some people will just focus on a handful of those votes and think you're evil or an ogre or, or whatever. Um, I think that you know part of the reason we're here today is to talk about you know what really is happening, wh where is some bar bipartisan success, and for us to get encouragement for you, from you that we're on the, the right track because we're not ideologues and you know way on one side or the other, and. So, you know, it's, it, part of it is an education experience on, on, on both sides. I think American people have to start to hold people accountable. They need to say to their elected representative, shutting down government's not okay. Uh, I think the American people have to, I mean, too many people don't think their vote matters. And they stay home and they don't engage. <coughs> Um, and I think that people need to start to really become more engaged in the electoral process, and they need to go to town hall meetings, get your elected representatives to hold town hall meetings, and to really ultimately, you know, if you look at when in the last year you saw people suddenly when they realized children were being ripped away from their parents, this country's conscience, thank God, woke up. And the president backed off. You saw something happen. We need more of that. We need more people saying, this isn't what we are in America. It's not OK. Great. Um, our next question is also from the audience. The question is, uh, when you see conflicts in the interests of your constituencies versus the interests of your parties in Washington, uh, do you ever see such conflicts, first off? And second off, uh, if so, how do you reconcile that? How, do you, how does that sort of manifest itself in the, in the day to day? Well, I mean, you have to look at the background that you have, the people that you trust. Um, the, you know, I, I'm, I consider myself uh, a governing Republican. Uh, I want to work, to, you know, keep the government open, a whole number of different things. I'm, I'm trying to think of where an issue might be purely partisan. I mean, you know, you look at the association of groups that you're with. So you got all these caucuses. They don't meet all that often, but you get a lot of information, particularly for the staff. You look at the groups that you're involved in, you know, Problem Solvers Caucus meets almost every week. There's 30 members that are there. We bring in, you know, Secretary Mnuchin from the Treasury Department or the head of, you know, the White House Congressional Affairs Office. She was, she was there the, the other day. I mean, they hear from us. It's, it's got to be a two-way street. Uh, I started the Tuesday group, which is the moderate Republican group in the House uh, back in, in the 90s. Uh, we meet every week. We talk about every issue. Um, that's there. You find a, a, a group of folks, no one likes to be the only person voting yes or no on your, so, and, and you build relationships on the, on the other side. I mean, you, you don't like to see a political position, um, you know, work on the, the daily functions of the House of things that we have to do. We have to pass all 12 appropriation spending bills. Uh, we have to, you know, deal with immigration. We have to, you know, we have to deal with the defense authorization bill. There's a lot of things that routinely come. We have to reauthorize the clean water bill. We have to reauthorize a highway bill, first time in five years uh, this year. We have to do an, an ag bill, which we did last year, which happens five years. You get into these cycles, and you got to know the issues and work with people on both sides to get them done, knowing that we have a, now a Republican Senate that doesn't have 60 votes and I don't think a Senate ever will have 60 votes again for one side or the other, in a House that's pretty narrowly divided, uh, not a big margin for, for Pelosi, not like what she had 10 years ago when she was Speaker. 
and you got a Republican White House that's, you know, sometimes four bills that they end up being against. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a whole new dynamic that's out there. You know, I'll give you an example, and I'll tell you where I probably won't be with Fred, but I'll be with President Trump. Uh, trade. When I, before I ever got sworn in, I was on CNN, and they thought you did a gotcha question about supporting President Trump on TPP, P, TPP. And I said, let me be clear. I will not support the president. I was opposed to TPP. Oh, no, well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the uh, when we have to do what I call NAFTA 2.0. <laughs> Maybe you'll be with me. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I said I was elected to represent the men and women of my district in my state. And I am not gonna support legislation that is gonna cost people jobs. And I, I, it was never, it was, I was one of the leaders of the anti-TPP, Ford Motor Company, Chrysler, the UAW, the supply. There was, this state knew that that bill was bad for them. And I'm gonna do what's right for the people that elected me. Now, NAFTA. I do not agree with President Trump on his trade policy and the way that it's been chaotic, not consistent. What he says at 10 a.m. may not be the same thing at 3 p.m. Trying to understand the, but NAFTA, you see all those shuttered factories in this state? It happened because NAFTA was a bill that cost us millions of jobs in this country. We no longer had a level playing field. You cannot compete when you've got Mexico paying $1.50 to $3, the most that people are making in a General Motors plant right now is $3.50 an hour. That's not a living wage. You need a level playing field. Now, NAFTA is not, and I call it NAFTA 2.0 because I don't want anyone to forget what NAFTA 1.0 did to this country. But if the, I, I, I talk to Lighthouser regularly. I've talked to, and if we get some of the things fixed. He's if, a trade rep. He's a trade rep, thank you. Um, if we, if I don't want to see General Motors put one more, you know, we're just shuttered four plants here and a plant in Canada, and General Motors announced it's building blazers in Mexico. And by the way, every one of those blazers is coming back into this country. That to me is not good policy. My job is to protect jobs for working men and women in this country. So that's, I'll work with whoever will do what's right for the people I was elected to represent. And he does do that. <laughs> what I'm do going to th tell the president you might be there. <laughs> well, I want to see what he's doing on tariffs, and there was a little letter to yep. anyway. I don't know. What do you see as the main values of your respective parties, and have the parties moved farther from the center in recent years? If so, why do you think this is how it is? You know, they, they are, these questions are all a little bit sort of the same to a degree, but it's... I, I just think the American people want us to deal with the issues that are before us. And their patience isn't real long these days. And, you know, we, we got to look for areas that, where, we, where we can agree. And we, uh, knowing that so many of these uh, different issues have to be reauthorized, and, you know, a 2.0 is a good thing. NAFTA needs to be improved. Uh, we'll see what the elements are of it. You know, our, our bill on 21st century cures, we're working already on an, another version that's going to add to what we did over those 10 years, learn, looking back and learning from what's happened the last three. Um, and what's frustrating is that at least on the, the big picture, so the, the <coughs> MSNBCs and the Fox, you see, you know, their guests, not Debbie, are often the folks that are on the fringes because they're the ones that are screaming at each other and they're the ones that maybe get higher ratings versus someone that may be trying to put some of the things together. Debbie's actually quite good on TV and she's not in that, that same group that I would put Louis Gomer in, um, <laughs> her Republican friend. Uh, but I, I think that's, that's part of the problem that we have is that the 24-7 news cycle often gets the, the folks on the far end and, and the other side or the middle just turns it off. You know, I think, again, I, I, I keep getting struck by, the, it, 
it's a hypothetical when you talk about the two-party system, but nobody's monolithic in either of these parties. So, you know, we've got a brand new freshman class in this new Congress. And I bet every one of you could give me the name of three who, uh, who are great and they're all friends of mine. But they don't represent, this isn't a monolithic class. The fact of the matter is, is that there's a group of veterans, women veterans, who are really much more, and they all have won in what we call red to blue districts, which are now frontline, that are, they're not going to support the, the new Green Deal has very important principles in it. Some, it, we're going to have to really study it and, and look at, we all agree that we've got to do something about global cl climate change and we've got about a dozen years left and you can see what's happening, how you get there and what the goal is, you know, where the difference should be. But this class had, I mean, just look at the Michigan delegation, by the way, and they kind of represent the diversity of this freshman class. You have Rashida, who's I'm sure one of the names that everybody here does know. MF kind of helped make her popular. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Alyssa Slotkin is one of the veterans that uh, get won Mike Bishop's seat. She is a, someone who's very dedicated to bipartisanship working across the aisle. I, by the way, I'll give you an example of something that I won't do. I will not campaign against an incumbent member in Michigan. I just, I, I won't give money. And I think our Michigan delegation needs to be a delegation that's got to work together. And that's just, it's, and Alyssa said to me, when she, I'm going to do the same thing when I get elected and, and has, and she's gone and, I don't know, she's, she's tried to meet with every yeah. Republican and is trying to... I met with her the other day for about an hour and a half. Yeah, it was very... And, you know, one of the things... That, so our delegation really is pretty close. Uh, we have regular meetings. Sort of. No, well, they're regular. <laughs> they're I'm regular. the lobbyist yeah. for more regular yeah. meetings, Fred. <laughs> yeah, but the delegation is... We look at issues where we can You walked into close. that. Yeah, I know. I did it on purpose. But... The, I'm always uh, nagging, Fred. Now you're getting me off stuff. But, you know, whether it's Great Lakes, whether it's autos, you know, the auto rescue plan saved Michigan. What was that? It was our delegation working together. And we worked together, and that was the time of the election with McCain running against Obama. And we got both of the candidates on board and President Bush to finish up the job as it, as it was getting started. But it was almost off the tracks, and... Speaker Boehner was the speaker, and Dave Camp and I, he was from Midland, uh, we went in to see him and said, you can't let this get off the tracks. We have to have this vote to get it done, and we passed it with an overwhelming margin, which helped carry it through the Senate. Without that bill, Michigan would be dead. Uh, As would the country. Yeah, it would have been. So, again, it was our delegation working together shoulder to shoulder that, that really got it done. Uh, this next question from the audience is on more of a policy note. The question is, how does Congress plan to address the opioid country, or the, excuse me, the opioid crisis that is sweeping our country in a bipartisan manner? Uh, and maybe if you can outline the progress that has been made so far. A couple things. This, this hits everybody, every community, every family. We all know somebody. Um, last year probably don't know this, but we passed about 60 bills in the, in, the, in the Congress, and the President signed every one of them. There might have been, all together in those 60 bills, maybe 12 people that voted against them. Um, and we moved them all individually. Debbie had a good number of bills. I was co-sponsor of hers. She was co-sponsor of mine. More education, more funding. One of the things, I'm going back to 21st Century Cures, so Obama signed that in December of 16. We put $2 billion into that for opioids. I bet a lot of people back then couldn't even spell it. But we knew it was a real problem. We're now seeing that money come down to the locals to try and help. When we, one of the things that we did over in my district just the last two months, we had a... Um, uh, I'll tell you the story. We had a young man that I knew that uh, played uh, basketball for Lakeshore High School, and he got into heroin, and he didn't make it. 
um, I think he might have even gone to jail a little bit, but he tried treatment. Um, and it was my boss's nephew. Dave Stockman was my first boss. He died, Sammy. So we have now started a center in St. Joe uh, that's been funded tens of thousands of dollars to help families uh, deal with this crisis. Don't know what to, where, to, where to turn to. We're gonna try to get the Surgeon General to come and, and do a, a forum there this fall before school starts. Uh, we've done those. We all know people. Families, what can we do to help? You know, thank God so-and-so they didn't go to jail or whatever. See, the movie Ben is back. Um, you know, uh, there's no answers. This stuff is so addictive. Uh, this fentanyl is so bad. I mean, we found that there was one postal inspector for all of West Michigan. You can't use dogs. Uh, at the State of the Union address, there was an officer, and he, a uh, policeman uh, from Ohio, and pulled somebody over. I don't know the whole story, but just the loose fentanyl, he, he overdosed, almost died. Uh, you talk to your law enforcement folks, and they're using Norcom you know, sometimes multiple times, you know, individual officers and sometimes the same people over three or four day stretch. So we need to do a lot more. Um, money is a part of this and we're just starting now to scratch the surface, but it's just, it's so scary to see this stuff that's so addictive and it comes in and it's so cheap. You know, there was a, a raid last week and they figured that there was enough fentanyl to to impact every American in the United States, because that's all it takes. Uh, the president on his interview on Meet the Press or whatever it was uh, two Sundays ago said that he raised it with uh, the Chinese about trying to get it stopped. Um, but at the same time, I mean, one of the bills that I got done that the president signed into law was more research to try and find out if we can find some non-addictive painkillers. You know, pain is an awful thing. I mean, people are willing to do anything if they have a, you know, bat, whatever that medical issue might be. You need the painkillers for it, but maybe we can develop some that are non-addictive that are not going to be like some of the others that are out there. And we're, we're just starting. And again, it was hugely bipartisan and something that we moved through our committee. And Debbie was a big part of that in, in terms of getting it done. It's a very personal issue to me. Um, and I can't talk about it today because I'm I get near I tears several times today. So we'll talk about it another day. But I will say this: that um, we have we're not doing enough. We made we did a beginning. Yeah, we started. We've only started. We got, we got a lot we more. We need to do. mental health. We need to remove the stigma from mental health. Um, many of you will remember about a year ago, a Central Michigan University student uh, ended up killing his parents. This was a very educational experience for me because he knew he had a drug problem. He went to the emergency room seeking health. There was no provider and no bed available to him. I met around the same time the grandparents of, uh, that were now taking care of their two grandchildren because their daughter was an opioid addict their grandson was already drawing pictures that showed disturb, and he could not get an appointment with a mental health provider for, they could not, eight months. And I said, whoa, 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 what is it? You know, I was trying to understand, was there a money problem? It wasn't a money problem. It was simply, and it's true here at the University of Michigan. I've got, since then, I've gone, I've met with the doctors at U of M, I've been to the emergency room, and they know they've got a problem. He, uh, that night of that horrible incident at Central, I was with many of the hospital administrators, and they told me that not one person had gone into inpatient psychiatry residency that year. We gotta, we've got to incentivize more people going into. There are many things. Every time FDA or NIH comes up and appears before the committee, I ask the same question, which Fred was just talking about. When are we going to get a non-addictive pain treatment drug? I mean, that's, and Francis always says, it's coming, it's coming. Well, it's got to do more than it's coming. It's got to get here. So we got to work together and do a lot of things. This is going to be the last question. 
Do you think Veterans Affairs is headed in the right direction, and does Congress have any plans to address veterans' issues? Well, Congress will continue. We need to. The men and women who serve this country and defend us need to be taken care of, period. It is one of my number one priorities, but I do yep. believe that it's veterans... the easiest vote that we cast. Uh, ...is to take care of them. There are issues. There have been management issues. Well, I mean, even there have been issues here at the Ann Arbor VA Hospital. Tim Wahlberg has gone... We, Tim and I, I don't think we should ever politicize taking care of a veteran, ever. And when there have been issues, I always make sure that Fred or Tim are with me at both the John Dingle VA Hospital and the Ann Arbor. Arbor, and we, we just have a moral responsibility to take care of those who serve. Absolutely. It's not where it needs to be, but all of us have got to. Right. That was just um, absolutely fantastic. Um, please join me in, in thanking our, our wonderful moderator and our great guests, <laughs> our terrific students um, for uh, organizing questions. Just a, a great event. Um, please join me uh, outside uh, along with our guests and our moderator for our reception in the Great Hall and thanks very much for being here at the Ford School.